Okay, I think we're ready. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to a Future in Space Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell from Deep Astronomy, and we are doing another, another live stream. Let's see how we get through this one. Today, we're going to be talking about telescopes on the moon. Have you ever heard of such a thing? It'd be a great telescopes on the moon. Very excited to talk about it. So it's been a couple of weeks trying to get ready for this particular stream because I know you'll find this hard to believe, but I don't know everything about astronomy. I know, I know. And that's also true with a lot of astronomers in the world these days either. I've talked to so many astronomers, I can't tell you how many, who don't know where basic constellations are in the night sky. So there's plenty of... There's plenty of astronomy non or specialization going on where we all know a lot about certain things, but not a lot about everything. Some people are better at it than others, right? I mean, I guess Neil deGrasse Tyson is probably the best at being knowledgeable about everything. But um, for most of us, we have to kind of look stuff up. And that's what I had to do on this one because I didn't know much about telescopes on the moon. And so I thought I would get myself familiar with some of the problems of it and what they would be good for. And we're going to talk about that here today. In fact, the format of this stream is such that I just get the ball rolling. I start with, I'll do, I'll do some basic setups of the knowledge base of, of what we're going to be talking about to kind of give us all on the same page uh, knowledge-wise. And then we'll have a discussion about this, either in the chat which I'm looking at, you know, I'm streaming on multiple platforms. So I've got all the chats coming through here, as well as my Deep Astronomy Discord server. Ooh, you know what I didn't do? I did not start that. Let me start it. Let me get that going. There I am. Okay, I am now. Let's see. Sorry, I should have had this set up and I didn't do it. There. Now I'm streaming on the Deep Astronomy Live uh, voice channel than the Discord server. So if you want to, and you join that server, and you have a microphone, uh, when, in a minute when I put my earphones on and I click the button over here, you will be streamed, your voice will be streamed on the, the chat, and we are on the stream, and we can talk about it uh, together, as if we are talking on the phone, which is also a, a brand new concept for a lot of people, I think. So I hope you won't get shy. Go ahead and get on there, and let's we'll talk later and uh, have a chat, have a conversation. So, oh, good. Dennis, uh, Dennis is here from uh, Twitch. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I know, I just got there. Sorry, I forgot to put that on. Uh, Uncle Bill's here. He's on mobile on YouTube. Uh, Susan, I haven't seen you in a while. Welcome back. There are a lot more astronomy out there undiscovered, so we're all needing to know more. That's right. I mean, science has gotten to this point where in order to make any any kind of, oh, hang, hang on, I'm just seeing a warning in my resolution. It says I'm streaming at 1280 by 736. Sorry, hang on just a sec. That's not right. It says here I'm doing 720p. 736, who the hell heard of that? Well, okay, so YouTube, let me know if you can see everything okay, because I just got a warning on my on my encoding. So I, I don't know, it looks, looks okay to me, so. Let me know. We have got, so if, if you think about how science has done lately, we, our body of knowledge has gotten so great that no single human being can ever know everything there is to know about a particular field of study, right? So we have, specialization is required. We have to pick a topic and then become expert in that. And our range of knowledge as a result suffers, but the depth of knowledge that we gain by doing this is much greater. So while a given astronomer may not know where the constellations are in the night sky, he certainly, if he specializes in it, he's certainly going to know a lot about life cycles of stars, galactic evolution, uh, cosmology, whatever it happens, large scale structure of the universe, whatever it happens to be. And it's kind of the way we have to be as human beings now. We can't, you know, back the days when we could all know everything about what we knew about the universe or long over. In fact, that was that probably maybe the Greeks, <laughs> if I think back far enough, maybe the Greeks knew everything there was to know. Um, they certainly set a pretty high bar on the philosophical stage that I still think has yet to be uh, surpassed. I mean, I was just talking with Charlotte on the phone before I started the stream about this new paper with Ethan Siegel 
uh, had written an article. He, he's the starts with the bang guy. He writes uh, for Forbes and a lot of other places. Great writer, by the way. If you don't know about Ethan Siegel, you should definitely read his stuff. It's really good. Anyway, there's this new article that he was reading. I was reading in this thing called Big Think, I think, where uh, they sort of rearranged the order between inflation and the Big Bang. And inflation, he is claiming, or not claiming, but he's writing about, uh, may have set the stage for a hot Big Bang that came a little bit later. And it was a very interesting article. I have to read it again to get it all together. But, um, you know, we're starting to get this, you know, this last second down of the universe where John Carroll always tells us, you know, we know pretty much the whole history of the universe down to about one second after the big bang, but that one second is pretty crucial. Anyway, we were talking about that on the phone before the stream. And, you know, it occurred to me that the Greeks, you know, are still, <laughs> we're still, they're still setting the bar for, for the problems that we think about in our place in the universe and whether or not there was a first cause and, and all of these other things. And, I'm trying to convince her to do a podcast with me uh, where we do regular episodes of this sort of discussion. So hopefully we'll be able to do that in future, in the future when we both get time. So, um, <laughs> so Stephen is commenting, uh, I don't want to see, oh wait, I don't want to see you anything better than, <laughs> very, oh, okay. All right. All right. I get that big Norge, but where was I going with, oh, it was this one. Uh, inflation is running rampant here in the UK. Yes, that kind of inflation is a little bit different. Hopefully, it's not exponential like it was at the beginning of the universe. My God. Um, okay, so let's get started. Telescopes on the moon. Why do we care about those? Oh, I, sorry, I'm looking to make sure my stream is okay. All right. Well, that's what we're going to try and settle right here in this stream. Who cares about who cares about uh, uh, telescopes on the moon? The moon is a very strange place if you stop to think about it, right? I mean, I remember back in the early '90s, I was in Colorado and I was running a nonprofit called Rocky Mountain Science Center, and one of the things we had was a small portable planetarium, a star lab, by the way. It was it was awesome. I love that thing. Set it up in gyms and stuff, and, and I would go through a star talk, you know, throughout the whole school day with whatever school I happened to be in, elementary, whatever. And a particularly difficult concept to teach was the lunar phases, the phases of the moon. What causes that different shape that we see in the sky every single night. And the way I used to teach it was, I would say to the kids, especially if they're in elementary school, I would say, okay, imagine this is the only way I could do it, that I could think of that would actually illustrate so that you could get it what the lunar phases were. I would say, okay, imagine that your head is the earth and pick up a ball. You know, I don't have a ball, but I do have, I do have this as sort of a rubber ducky here. And I, now imagine this, this is from Dan, by the way. Um, Imagine that this is the moon and it goes around your head. Now you have, let's see if I can do this. I'm going to rotate this light up because okay, so I have a light right there. This isn't going to work great because of the way the camera and everything is sort of outlined. But if this is the moon and your head is the earth and that bright light over there is the sun, start to move the duck around your head. But at the same time, make sure that the face of the duck is always pointed at your head. Okay, so this is how the moon goes around the earth. The, the duck always points to you. You always see the face of the duck. <laughs> but how much of it you see changes depending on where it is in relation to the light bulb right over there. So if I had it, I can't do this right because the camera's at a different angle from this. So you're going to see a different vantage point. But if right about here, I'm seeing half of the duck from the light, that's a half moon. Well, and then I go, what would, what, what would it take to see a full moon and see if they're getting it? And they're like, oh, if you go all the way around like this, now you can see the full moon and your head is the earth. And that's a full moon. So I used to do this, not with a duck, but with uh, little styrofoam balls. Thank you, Dan, by the way, for this. And um, my Canadian friend, and um, it kind of got through. I mean, you know, the lunar phases are, it's, it, there's a lot of geometry going on there. And I think we need to remember that geometry when we talk about telescopes on the moon, right? This is because it's going to come into play. 
So the thing, <laughs> the thing that, um, the thing that we're going to need to remember about this is let me do, I, I also have some other, some other, um, illustration. So here, if you've ever wondered what a lunar day is, what is the day on the moon? We know what a, it takes. You know, well, actually, let me just, I'm, I'm getting this. I'm, I'm getting, um, ahead of myself. Let me pull up my slides. Okay. So here are my slides. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about the orbit of the moon. We got started on that. I showed you a little bit about the phases. Uh, so here's some of the uh, facts about the orbits of the moon. The moon Earth orbits the Earth once every 27 and a half days. It passes between the Earth and the sun every 29 and a half days. That's the lunar day that I want to get into in just a minute. The moon is tidally locked, meaning the, that the duck face always faces towards you as you go around. The moon's orbit is tilted. You can see what that means by that little diagram off to the right there. That's uh, that's a, It's got about a five degree tilt with respect to um, the orbital plane of the solar system. And the moon orbits almost perfectly upright with respect to the plane of the solar system. It only deviates about one and a half percent from the plane of the solar system. So it's oriented this way, pretty much straight up and down. It is tilted five degrees from the Earth, and that's an important uh, orbit that talk, that shows why we don't always have uh, solar eclipses in the same spot every single time. And um, it's tidally locked, so the same part of it always faces Earth. All of this matters if you're going to build stuff on the moon itself. So ooh, I don't want to go there yet. So let's go a little bit more into this orbit. I want to show you this. Let me get this in big end. I, I found this and made a real quick little loopy animation. Hopefully, oops, hopefully this loops. So here's a picture of the earth or an animation of the moon going around the earth. You can see that the moon is facing the same spot every time. It is, um, it is rotating at the same rate that it revolves around the earth. The phases, you can see the phases in there. This was actually a good animation. I kind of wish I had had this when I was teaching elementary school kids. This isn't bad. Um, so a day on the moon is equal to one lunar orbit, and, or it could be defined as the when you see the sun in the same spot in the sky every single, you know, where how long it takes for the sun to get to the same part of the sky. If you take an imaginary line and you draw it from the directly overhead down to the horizon, that's called the meridian. Um, if you, and the, you know, that could be local noon. If you wait for that period between passings of that meridian, you get one day, whether it's on the earth or on the moon. It takes the, on the earth, it takes 24 hours for that to happen. And on the moon, it takes 29 and a half days. So that's a lunar day. Which means, in with respect to lunar telescopes, if you build it anywhere on the moon, there is going to be a part of it that for a good couple of weeks is going to be facing the sun. And for another good couple of weeks, it's going to be facing away from the sun. So we want to think about this, where to put something on the moon uh, with that in mind, right? So... And I'm going to get to advantages and disadvantages of some of these things in just a minute. But I wanted to show you that. So, so the moon's a really weird place. And it has a lot of things going for it, not the least of which is that it is relatively close by. It takes us about three days to get there if we wanted to travel there. So building a place on the, building a, an observatory on the moon uh, could actually be something we could think about. So let's go back to this and let me go back to my slides. Okay, so that's the orbit of the moon. So what are some advantages of having a lunar telescope? Well, you don't have to worry about the Earth's atmosphere. And as we've talked about in the, in the ground-based versus space-based talk we had a few weeks ago, we learned the atmosphere is really a pain in the ass when it comes to astronomy. So Getting rid of that atmosphere is always a good thing with respect to astronomy, not with respect to staying alive. That would that would not be a good thing for us to 
to get rid of. And so what that means is without the atmosphere, certain wavelengths become available to us that are not currently available, right? Uh, for example, the UV, we cannot observe anything in the UV from Earth. Um, and the IR, I showed you that absorption spectrum of the atmosphere and how opaque uh, much of the electromagnetic spectrum is to astronomers uh, because of the atmosphere. And finally, there's radio uh, um, wavelengths that we could get to that we can't on Earth just simply because of the amount of noise on the Earth. Um, and there's also a lot of, there's also some opacity to the atmosphere, especially at long, long wavelengths um, to uh, in radio. Now, another advantage is we could build really big ones there, right? Um, we're not limited to getting things in space from rockets, putting things in orbit via rockets uh, or having to be automated or robotic in any way. We could build some pretty big ground-based sized telescopes on the moon, especially if we had a, a lunar base there. And uh, we can build a base there also, which is another advantage to let the astronomers actually live there, uh, making just all of the attendant things that goes with running an observatory possible, right? The things that are, we can do on the ground, just because we're on the ground, is really a, a lot greater than things we can with space telescopes, as we talked about a few weeks ago. If we wanted to upgrade the detectors, for example, well, that's a hell of a lot easier to do on the ground than it is up in orbit. So having something on the on the moon, on the surface of the moon, would make upgrades and rebuilding and tinkering a hell of a lot easier. So that's some of the advantages. Some disadvantages is that, well, that lunar day I was telling you about, I think that's a problem. And you guys tell me what you think, but I think this is a problem. Um, the sun is going to be in the way a lot, okay? And another big problem is <laughs> because the moon has no atmosphere, the temperature fluctuations are huge. It can get as hot as 127 C during the day, and it can get as cold as minus 173 C at night. So that is a huge difference, uh, temperature swing, right? That would play havoc on a lot of optical elements that have to remain precisely aligned throughout that temperature pit range, right? There's this thing called flexure in a, in a telescope where the, the whole thing kind of expands and contracts. Uh, the optical elements do, the, the the substructure does that holds all the elements lined up. All of this stuff would get would be would need to be super rigid and, and, and impervious to temperature swings and still maintain high alignment abilities, right? So uh, the temperature fluctuations to me is a big disadvantage for putting things on the moon. You don't have the ability like with JWST, we're putting that out at the L2 point in large part because, we can we can keep one side of the telescope always faced away from the sun. It follows the Earth as it goes around the sun, keeping the temperature much more stable. And, and of course, in the case of JWST, it has to get a lot colder than anything on the moon would be able to get. So it's a hostile environment. And, of course, another disadvantage is that we don't have any, any infrastructure there yet to do any of this. Now, you guys, these are just what I could think of. If you guys could think of more, then, then let me know. Um, uh, and I'll get to it here in just, in just a bit. Let me just get through some of my, <clears throat> my slides here. <clears throat> All right. So what about where would we put it? Where would we put this thing? A uh, couple of possibilities. Um, back in 2005, they did a study. Um, somebody did a study that said they think they found the perfect spot to put a moon base. It's in the North. It's near the Northern uh, lunar pole near, uh, I guess, the northern rim of Perry Crater. Um, it uh, it would make a good ide ideal place because it has a lot of sunlight, and that's important for a moon base because of the solar panels that you would want to use to power that moon base. So having almost constant sun in the northern pole would be a good thing for a moon base, and it might be a good thing if you're operating a solar telescope there. I'm not so sure. It'd be great for anything trying to look at the early universe. Not a lot of water on that part of the moon. The LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, has, uh, has I'm going to show you some really cool pictures from that in just a minute, um, has shown wh where a lot of the water is, and a lot of it's in the South Pole. And the South Pole is where I think a halfway decent telescope would go. It's near the dark. It's almost you know it's darker there. Remember, the... 
the the tilt of the moon doesn't vary much. It's have one and a half percent, you know, not that it, so it's more or less straight up. It doesn't have a lot of areas that are constantly in darkness that are constantly in sunlight. The tilt of the planet versus its rotation axis is what determines whether something is in darkness or light. Anybody who's been to the North pole knows, you know, the six months or months long darkness that can happen there in winter. Same with Antarctica. So, you know, because of the pole tilt of the earth, with respect to its rotation, we can get these areas of near constant darkness and near constant um, sunlight. So I don't know if the pole locations would be all that great for radio telescopes, okay? Because one of the things that radio telescopes need is shielding from all the noise that comes off of the Earth. So I'm not sure you'd want to put one near the poles, but certainly on the on the far side of the moon, um, you could put a radio telescope, and I'll talk about that more in just a minute. Um, I wanted to show you some of the things that I found while getting ready for this, while getting ready for this um, uh, this stream. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter for the has mapped the entire lunar surface to within a meter resolution. And some of the things that it's been able to do has been has been pretty is pretty amazing. Like for example, here is an example of here's an anime make this big. Here's an example of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter going over the Apollo 14 landing site. That's how well, and this is all over the surface. So we've got a pretty good idea of what things are like, where a good, you know, the geology, or at least the surface topology of the moon um, in uh, in this, with this, with this orbiter. So I thought that was pretty cool. And another thing I found was, um, let's see if I can find this. Oh, here is an example. Here's a remaster using, um, no, wait, that's not it. Hold on. This, uh, Where'd it go? Oh, um, I know what I want to show you. So let me show you this first. So here is an animation of the South Polar region taken from LRO. Um, this is a bit of a long animation, so I'm going to zoom it up. So here's LRO getting close to the South Pole of the moon. And um, here, I'll just make that a little bit. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Uh, let me make that bigger. There. So here it is flying over the South Polar region of the moon. This resolution is stunning. Now, this is where I think a good spot for a telescope would be for the fact that it's got a lot of areas in darkness, a lot of water down here as well. But for solar panels, might not be such a great spot if you're looking to get a lot of power. So there's always a give and take, even on the moon, with locations and what you're going to be able to do with it. I just find this really amazing and, and somewhat mesmerizing to watch. <laughs> I mean, even the Apollo astronauts didn't have cameras this good. So you can see these pockets in the craters where the shadows are. These are where they're thinking water ice, whether well, not thinking, they found water ice in some of those shadows. And this will be a good source of um, raw materials. If you've never gone to the LRO uh, mission site at uh, NASA.gov, or even to the uh, the visualization site at svs.gsfs or goddardspaceflightcenter.nasa.gov, you can do searches on all this stuff and find amazing uh, animations and images of the moon from that mission. It's really quite stunning. So I wanted to show you that. That was pretty cool. And then there was one other thing. Uh, oh, this was a recreation of, um, see if I can pull it up. Here we go. This is a recreation using uh, LRO data and, um, damn it, and um, 
a, a, a orbiting Earth satellite of the Earth rise that occurred in Apollo eight. <laughs> they redid this. Uh, they redid this visualization, and I thought it was pretty cool. I'm just fast forwarding through it. Um, this is data from LRO plus uh, an Earth an Earth orbiting satellite put together and recreated from the Apollo eight trajectory. Uh, which was that famous iconic, you know, that iconic Earthrise and thing movie that they took uh, when they flew around the moon. I found this just poking around, so I wanted to show it to you. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. All right. So, let me get my screens back. So, I think think that's everything I wanted to show you. Let me, uh, oh, okay. No, I, I made one more slide that just was a prompt for the latest work. So where are we now? What are we, are there any plans to do this? I mean, I've, I've given you a sort of a really rough sketch of advantages, disadvantages, what we could use a lunar telescope for, um, and, and a little bit about the weirdness of the moon. So I found this now, maybe you guys know more and please let me know if you do, uh, find other, other programs, but earlier this year in May of 2021, NASA gave JPL a uh, half million dollars to, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, half million dollars, uh, to look into the lunar crater radio telescope. And this is something that I think we've all heard of. This was back in May. Uh, and here's a couple of visualizations. I used it for the background of my slides. Um, you know, here you can see some some picture. Unfortunately, can I make this big? Yeah. Okay, good. So here are some some pictures that they took of a what it would look like. Um, here's one of a, in a little crater. You can see the uh, it's built inside of there. Um, It's on the lunar far side. Here's a close-up of that. Reflect. It's a lot like the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. It was built, the one in Puerto Rico was built in a natural depression in a valley in a mountain range. Uh, here we have craters uh, that would make good homes for these radio telescopes. And there's what it would look like uh, from that angle. So... NASA was given NASA gave JPL a half million dollars to a, to support additional work as it enters phase two of the Innovation Advanced Concepts program. And it's while this is not yet a mission, uh, the LCRT uh, describes a mission concept that could transform humanity's view of the cosmos. The LCR's primary objective would be to measure the long radio long wavelength radio waves generated by the cosmic dark ages. This is the period that JWST is going to look at in the infrared. And uh, this is a period that lasted a few hundred million year, years after the Big Bang, but before the first stars came uh, into existence. Cosmologists know little about this period, but think the answers to some of science's biggest mysteries may be locked in the long wavelength radio emissions generated by the gas that would have filled the universe during that time. So radio telescopes on Earth can't probe this mysterious period because the long wavelength radio waves, I wish I, I need to get that graphic backup that I showed you a couple of talks ago, um, where the, the atmosphere is opaque at these wavelengths that they can't get through. Um, and these are from a time, uh, from that time are reflected by a layer of ions in the electrons at the top of our atmosphere, a region called the ionosphere. We just bounce out into space. Random radio emissions uh, from our noisy civilization can also interfere with radio astronomy as well, drowning out the faintest signals. But on the moon's far side, there's no atmosphere to reflect these signals, and the moon itself would block Earth's radio chatter. So the lunar far side could be prime real estate to carry out unprecedented studies of the early universe. Radio telescopes on Earth cannot see cosmic waves, radio waves, uh, at about a, at about 33 feet or 10 meters uh, or longer because of the ionosphere. So there's a whole region of the universe that we simply cannot see. Uh, but previous ideas of building a radio antenna on the moon have been very resource intensive and complicated. So we were compelled to come up with something different. So here's what they plan on doing. Uh, to be sensitive to wrong, long radio wavelengths, the LCRT would need to be huge. The idea is to create an antenna over a half mile or a kilometer wide in a crater over two miles or three kilometers wide. 
the biggest single dish radio telescope on earth, like the 500 meter um, uh, aperture spherical telescope fast in China, uh, and the now inoperative uh, 300 meter wide Arecibo telescope in uh, Puerto Rico were built inside natural bowl like depressions of the landscape and to support to provide support structure. This class of radio telescope uses thousands of reflecting panels suspended inside the depression to make the entire dish's surface reflected to radio waves. The receiver then hangs via a system of cable cables at a focal point over the dish, anchored by towers at the dish's perimeter to measure the radio waves bouncing off the curved surface below. But despite its size and complexity, even fast is not sensitive enough to radio wavelengths longer than about four meters. So with this team of engine, with his team of engineers, roboticists, and scientists, JPL Bandiab, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that, uh, uh, condensed this radio of tele, this class of radio telescope down to its most basic form. And their concept eliminates the need to transport prohibitively heavy material to the moon and utilizes robots to automate the construction process. Instead of using thousands of reflective panels to focus incoming radio waves, the LCRT would be made of thin wire mesh in the center of the crater, and then one spacecraft would deliver the mesh, and a separate lander would deposit uh, duaxle rovers um, to build the dish over several days or weeks. And the duaxle, which is a robotic concept being developed at JPL, looks like this. Uh, that's what they're planning on, you know, using to build the thing with. So that's the only thing I've heard about, um, that's going on. Have you guys heard of anything more? Okay. So now I have gone through my, my spiel took about a half an hour and, um, let me, let me see if anybody is listening in on the. Uh, we got a, one person in there, but I don't know if anybody wants, you don't have to talk, Evan, if you don't want to. Um, okay. But if you do, I've got my headphones on and if you say something, I can hear them. Okay. Let's get to the chat. Why can't we disagree already? There's a fight going on. What's going on here, guys? Quantum bear trap. Are you causing trouble? Uh, if we want to go to the moon, how did we get through the Van Allen belt? Oh, so I see what was happening here. These are all CGI images, facts. And then he's put some emojis in there, like a movie camera, a green square, and an explosion. Those lunar images from LRO, you're saying, are... are um, our CGI images, not data. Well, you can just say things if you want to, <laughs> but uh, they're not. It's it's data and images of the moon. Um, so, although a lot of the chat is about this, oh my, you guys are you guys are fighting about this. Oh, quantum bear track, so fake. He says. Okay, well, you know, I can just say stuff too. You know. Um, the moon is is made of green cheese. I can just say that, like you just said, this is fake. Uh, but you're going to probably want me to back it up, some kind of statement that supports this. So I know I shouldn't be getting into this, but you know, I, I I'm just kind of tired of people just saying stuff, just saying words. The election was you know stolen. It's a big lie. You know, the Earth is flat. You just say stuff, and nothing ever. You know, there's, there's there's no there's no responsibility on your part to back it up. We're just supposed to go. Oh, you know what? This is fake. Quantum Bear Trap says this is fake, and he's not like saying why. But I'll go ahead and go with this random stranger who says it's fake. Lol, and uh, go from there. Anybody who wants to convince anybody else of anything has to be able to show some evidence, right? And, you know, the, the evidence of all of the things I'm talking about is well established and you're more than welcome to verify any of it on your own. In fact, you can, you won't, but you can, and you can, otherwise you're just going to say stuff, right? Like right now it's dark out. I don't see the sun. The sun is not in my window, which means it doesn't exist, which means I don't see it. 
and it's not there. I could just say stuff. And, you know, what are you going to say back to me? <laughs> the sun's right there. I'm going to be like, no, it's not. It is. It's right there, shining right up in the sky. No, it's not. <laughs> I could just do that. And that's just, all it is, is irritating. So, I mean, just stop it. Um, okay, Dan is commenting on micromedia rights. You're talking about <clears throat> as a disadvantage to, land, to putting things on the moon? Yeah. Um, uh, the... Uh, I would think a bigger problem with micro than micrometeorites are actually some bigger meteorites, right? The moon is hit or bombarded all the time with things that, depending on what we're calling micro, I mean, are we talking things grain of sand size? Or are we talking about something the size of your fist? Uh, can do a lot of damage, there's no question. And that is a vulnerability. So that would have a lot to say about where on the surface of the moon you decide to build this. Where do you think it's more likely to be vulnerable to that kind of impact? and choose accordingly. There's a lot of factors, just like on Earth, when you pick a telescope location on the moon, you have to consider what you're gonna do with it. Like I maintain that putting a radio antenna in one of the poles is a bad idea because it's not gonna shield you as well from noise from the Earth as it would if you put it directly in the center of the far side of the Earth or the moon. I don't know, however, if that makes it more vulnerable to impacts from other things, you know, coming at it. It might, in which case this wire mesh design that these guys at JPL have come up with would, I think, mitigate some of that because a wire mesh, if it gets a hole in it, is still probably going to pretty much work. Um, and the same is true with the way, you know, if you connect up all these solar panels in such a way that if one of them is damaged, you still get a lot of other uh, electricity as a result, then, you know, uh, that would be, you, you mitigate these these risks, right? By just making sure, well, if it does get hit, what's going to get knocked out, right? Now, if the receiver took a direct hit from a meteor or a micrometeorite and got damaged, that's uh, that's a single point of failure that you need to think about. But what are the, what's the likelihood of that happening? Uh, it also is something you need to, to think about. So I don't know. Uh, micrometeorites are a problem. They definitely would be an issue on the lunar surface. Whether they're big enough to not to to worry about mitigating it, I don't know. Third Rock, but Tony, hi Third Rock. It's good to see you, by the way. Um, a new study from ESA NASA Solar SOHO Observatory showed that the layer of gases surrounding our planet stretches to six hundred thirty thousand kilometers, which is about twice the distance to the moon. Yes. So my response is that maybe, I don't know, I, I accept that for the, at face value because I don't, I don't know for sure. But even if that's true, is it enough, this, this layer of gas, to block out the wavelengths that we care about? I think a good test of that would be Hubble. Hubble is in low Earth orbit. It's very, very close to the Earth compared to the moon. And it is able to make UV observations quite nicely and certainly a lot of infrared observations as well. So I would argue that these layer of gases, while they may be there, are probably so tenuous that they won't affect the incoming um, radiation from these wavelengths that we want to observe. Um, so that that's an interesting idea. I did not know that. But it, if that's true, then, then uh, I don't think it's going to be thick enough to mitigate being able to see, for example, in the UV, because we can certainly do that from, uh, from Hubble. Um, and of course, that's also true with JWST, but it may be a little bit, you know, 630 kilometers. We're like, well, JWST be further out. It'd be a million and a half kilometers out. So it won't be affected by that at all. Uh, Architufus. Hello, Architufus from Twitch. Uh, we can build big but we can't even fund Arecibo here on Earth. I think a lunar observatory is a pipe dream. I feel like Arctufus, I'm starting to have an unintended effect on you. I I, I hear you, man. <laughs> and I am about as, uh, it's like, we can't even fund Arecibo here. What the hell are we talking about building stuff on the moon? I know, I hear you, man. I'm not saying any of this is going to happen. But this is something that we all find relatively an interesting thought experiment. So we'll we'll talk about the issues of building a uh, telescope on the moon, uh, whether or not we have any will, money, uh, or desire in any way whatsoever to build this damn thing. Um, I couldn't agree more. We can't even do 
basic crap. We can't even build Elf, the Exo Life Finder, which if I were going to give a priority to anything, it would be that. Um, I don't think building telescopes on the moon is uh, should even be number 10 on our priority list. But, you know, it is something people have been talking about a lot. And so I decided to look into it to see if this is, uh, you know, how, you know, how useful this whole idea is. So um, it is a pipe dream. I agree. Um, so I, <laughs> I hope you were, you were like this before you started watching my streams because I, I feel a little responsible. I know I am, I, I shit all over stuff. So I'm the same way. I have zero. I'm so cynical these days. Uh, Hans Milling. What about lunar dust? They say it gets in everywhere. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be an issue. You got to engineer stuff to deal with that. Um, these telescopes won't have pointing capability. The ones that we saw with that lunar crater idea that's you can't point these telescopes they just the pointing is done by this the, the planet the, the celestial body that it's on in Arecibo's case it's the earth and the fast case in china that's also the rotation of the earth uh here it would be uh wherever that that um that crater is pointing would be its field of view so there's no pointing so there's no complicated machinery in that respect uh which gears and you know drives and stuff like that might get in the way. I think you can make this about as a static a thing as a telescope could be. So I don't know if it'd be that big of an, is an issue, but you're right. Uh, Architufus, uh, make a dual purpose observatory. Can it be solar for half of the time? That's, yeah. I mean, there's a radio telescope can look at the sun. The sun is also a really huge source of noise uh, in the radio spectrum. And so I don't, while you've shielded a radio telescope from Earth's noise, there's going to be a good couple weeks where it's pointing near the sun and going to be bombarded with with um, radiation and radio waves from the sun. So can you use that to do research? Probably. I imagine there's some interesting bits of information you can get out of the sun that way. But I think what you really meant was, let's build an observatory there that when it's pointed at the sun is optimized for looking at the sun. And when it's pointing into deep space, let's build some telescopes that are optimized for that. And that I think you're on the right track for. The needs and requirements of looking at the sun are completely different than what you would need to build something to look at deep space with. The early universe, distant galaxies require a different optical structure than what you would need to look at the sun. Again, depending on the wavelength range we're talking about. But what I would like to see is some kind of dedicated solar observatory, maybe built up on the North Pole of the moon, that looks at the sun all the time in wavelengths that, that are, are interesting to whatever we need, whether it's, you know, H alpha, uh, uh, extreme ultraviolet, X-rays. Uh, that's another, I think, really good <laughs> thing you could do with a lunar telescope is an X-ray telescope. That would be um, a really good use of, of putting things out. And that would be useful both when it's looking at the sun and when it's looking at distant objects out in the, in the, in the, dark, the dark part of the, when, of the moon, of the lunar orbit. That would be a good dual use telescope, in my opinion, as well. Because when it's pointed, there's a ton of good information to be gleaned in X rays by looking at the sun. And then when it's looking in deep space, again, a lot of good information. Now, what I don't know, because I don't know enough about X ray telescopes, is to say, is it good enough uh, what you build for looking at the sun? The same as what you would look at far away? Or do you need a different optical arrangement entirely? In that case, you build them side by side, which, of course, doubles the cost, maybe triples the cost. I don't know. But it's a good idea, especially at, at certain wavelengths where you're interested in both the sun and deep space. UV comes to mind and X-rays comes to mind. So, um, Larry, is that you in, in Discord? Is that your face I'm seeing? Okay, let me just get you in the stream. There you go. Hey, Larry, I'm amazed you're there. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, it's good to hear you too. I mean, I love that picture of the Earth rising. Yeah, wasn't that nice? That was really cool. Uh, remember the days yeah. when we couldn't get you logged into Twitch? <laughs> I, yes, I'm really. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> and here you are on Discord. <laughs> talking on the stream well welcome i'm glad you're here uh yeah that was a pretty cool uh it was a recreation it wasn't actually there but they they used the trajectory of apollo 8 and the different data sets that they had available and recreated that earth rise i thought that was pretty um 
be it would be amazing to be able to see that i think up close oh yeah uh, so but. it was it, it was a uh, an image that uh, jpl produced uh, right after uh, the the apollo missions and uh, it was absolutely absolutely stunning yeah yeah it was well it's one of those things where you know, it may go into the moon all worth it, right? I mean, uh, yeah, really. That quantum bear trap guy is freaking out right now because I'm talking about going to the moon. But yeah, when we actually <laughs> went there and orbited it during Apollo 8, quantum bear trap. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to troll him. <laughs> Who is this turkey anyway? Oh, he's just some guy who thinks everything's fake. Um, so uh, ah. let me get to Susan Hunter's question. I just saw it in the chat. I got to scroll way down here to get to it, though, because I'm way up in the chat. Uh, Susan uh, has got a question. Um, would a telescope orbiting the, around the moon, which could rotate to shield itself, be cheaper? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how this much any of this would cost. But if I think about scalability, and infra if we have the infrastructure on the moon already, I would say the answer is no, because we could build this stuff from a moon base and materials and stuff that we've already set up. This is, again, why I'm interested in more in going to the moon before going to Mars, because the moon offers a really amazing wealth of possibilities that we can get, that we can get and it's only three days away. Uh, and we get a lot of experience. The experience that we gain by working on the moon, we can use in going to Mars. But <laughs> I think we should start here. And one of those things is in building infrastructure. I mean, say what you will about all these space billionaires. I don't think much of them, but that Jeff Bezos, I think with his, with his emphasis on infrastructure has the right idea because he's, he knows by building Amazon all too well that he couldn't have built Amazon if the postal service didn't already exist. There was infrastructure already in place for his business to succeed. He gets the need for that. So if we had an infrastructure in space first, whether we had the gateway and in cis lunar space, or we have moon yeah. bases uh, already on there with an infrastructure of you know a place where you can go sleep and and eat and and uh, work then then that would make everything else possible. So building yeah. on the surface then I think becomes cheaper. However, if we don't have any of that, but let's say we do have the gateway up in, in orbit, then maybe it's cheaper to put one in orbit around there. But I think we would want to build it, even if it is an orbit around the moon. Uh, I think we'd want to build it in space rather than on the ground, uh, and then try and launch it up. So, um, so, um, and so she's further commenting: um, no, no, no lunar dust on an orbiting flat platform solves some problems, yes, and creates others. There's always trade-offs, aren't there? So. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the best solution is. It all comes down to the question that every astronomer asks before it builds anything anywhere is what do we want to learn? What is our goal? What's our science objective? That drives everything that follows. So if our objective is to look at a certain region in the early universe at a certain wavelength, then it makes sense to build radio telescopes in a crater on the far side of the moon to look at those things with. If, however, we want to see the sun in x-rays at some resolution, then maybe a, a ground, a moon-based uh, surface-mounted x-ray telescope is a good idea. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, it, it, you, but you need to answer those questions first before you decide what we're right. building. Right now, I think the moon is a good thing for some stuff and not a good thing for other stuff. I think... I, I think anything that involves surveys over like trying to find transients like um, asteroids coming at Earth, things like that. I think the moon is a terrible place because you, you're you're you can't see anything for half the time out there because you're facing the sun. So but, it, you know, it would be fine for other things like point and shoot telescopes, large aperture telescopes studying exoplanets, maybe, you know, might be a good good spot for that i think we need more infrastructure on the moon to make any of this worth that's for sure yeah so i mean i i just so it, we, we, when we talk about space billionaires and their priorities um i think jeff bezos is is working toward the this in the right path versus uh just elon musk who wants to send people to them to mars and let's just get people on there um 
I think we've got a lot of really great experience and work that can be done on the moon first that would help us get to Mars if we could just be a little bit more patient. Absolutely. Funny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me get to some more comments. Uh, King, King Bala, put a webcam on the moon and live stream the earth. More environmental awareness. Hey, did you guys see William Shatner uh, go up yesterday? I was watching it here on Discord with a couple of friends here on the server. And uh, <laughs> William Shatner, boy, he got all beclamped at the end of it there. He got the vapors because he was just overwhelmed with emotion when he landed. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, there's an effect. This is called an overview effect or something like that. All astronauts, I guess, are subject to this effect where they land on the Earth and they're just mesmerized. Because I can't imagine going up in orbit or even into space for a few minutes and looking at the earth from that vantage point and not getting some kind of recalibration on our place in the universe, right? I mean, that's just going to have to be existential in changing how we look at ourselves, right? So it makes perfect sense that people get that emotional after having, having gone up there. And I think your idea is awesome for that, for that very reason. I think part of the reason it's so emotional for people is that when you see the earth up in space from your when you're up in space looking down at the earth you have this perspective that the, you don't see country lines you don't see you know divisions you don't even see people you just see a blue orb in space traveling around the sun that's all you see and when you think about it you know, you realize what a fragile place this appears to be. And you don't want to just, you know, shit all <clears> over it uh, when you're up there. And you, it would help you to, I think, appreciate the earth a little bit more. I personally hope that Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk can get as many people who deny climate change up into space as they possibly can. Let's send Quantum Bear Trap up there. That's all. Put up a cloud. <laughs> let's put up a uh, a crowdsourcing. Uh, what do you call it? Um, thing where you. I, I'm drawing a blank on what it is now. Uh, 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 but let's let's get him a ticket and go up there and show him show him for himself. <laughs> this is all fake. Um, I don't know if we want to waste our money on that. But but the <laughs> the the point is that a few minutes spent up in space, just looking down, even the way Jeff Bezos does it, uh, is, is priceless for this kind of education. And, um, I think we should, we should ship everybody up who denies climate change, who, who doesn't think we've been to the moon, who doesn't think the earth is round, all of these things, just get them up there and, uh, and just show them. Um, at least that is possible now, or at least becoming more possible if you're not like fuck you rich and stuff, but you, most people are, um, go fund me. That was it. I couldn't think of it. Galaxy. It was another one. Kickstarter. That's the other one. That's the other one. Right. Uh, but you know what? If we're going to do that, let's do it for me. I'd rather go, <laughs> you know, fuck that guy. I'd rather, I want to go. <laughs> oh, so there we go. Ah. <laughs> uh, Let's see. Oh, God. Put all the flat earthers on a rocket. Ha ha, I'll go to Hollywood. I don't even understand what you're talking about now. Okay. Yeah. Is that what that is? Is that what happens? Um, okay. Uh, again, I, I, why am I engaging with you? NASA admits that we don't live on a spinning ball. NASA is my sort. Well, you're going to have to. Okay. Uh, we. We li we're on a sphere. We're on a spinning oblate spheroid. Maybe not a perfect sphere, but we are on an oblate spheroid. Um, NASA is my source here. Facts. Well, you know what we're going to need here, buddy, <laughs> is some citations. <laughs> NASA also says that you know I that, that the you know whatever you want to say, and then if you don't back it up, then you know it's not going to be it's not going to go very far. So Tony, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, it's you know those the, that old line about uh, never smarten up a chump or give a sucker an even break. No, I never heard that. <laughs> oh, it's a it's a WSC Fields, I think. I, I'm not oh, sure. Oh man, anyway, Dude, I'm not that old, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am. <laughs> 
I know, man. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop, dude. It's like, oh, what am I doing here? Wasting my time. Um, I know. I'm just biting the troll bait. Let me go back up to the scroll up here and see what um, Charlie is commenting. Uh, Deep astronomy. Arecibo has the ability to track objects over a limited area. There are mechanical trackers supporting the prime focus instruments. I know. I don't mean to say it can't do any tracking. There are some uh, tilts that you can do with these ground mounted uh, uh, dishes. Uh, you can also tilt the uh, receiver in certain ways across the dish to get a f to get at the focus of certain off axis uh, uh, signals. So I know it does have some track. I don't mean to say it doesn't have any, but what, but it doesn't have the ability to do is go look over at this part of the sky and then slew over to another part of the sky. Um, you know, it does not have that ability. Is I guess what I mean, but you're right. Within the field of view of the crater, wherever it's pointing, or the valley, in the case of uh, Arecibo, then you know, yes, there is there is some pointing. You're right. So I don't mean to discount that. Uh, Michael Burke, there are. It's great that some people don't believe we've been to the moon. More room for the rest that do. Um, okay, uh, let's see another comment. There are already structures on the moon. The proof is out there. Just do some research. Into what? <clears throat> Do research into what? The structures on the moon? And 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 how about showing us the research that you've done? When people tell me to do my research or I've done research into this, well, I'd like to see it. So accuse me of not doing research. You know, it's like I've looked into this as about as far as it's warranted and there's nothing to see. There's no research to do. Uh, there are no facts to verify. <laughs> so to tell me to do some research is means what go on Wikipedia and look around. What is, what do you mean by, by doing some research? I'm happy to do it. If there's some credible evidence to follow up on, but there isn't. So I would offer that you show us your research. If you're making a claim that there are structures on the moon, then to convince me, all you have to do is show me your evidence. You know, what did you find when you looked into it? That's how you convince other people. Just saying stuff isn't going to convince anybody. But if you've got a claim and you've got some evidence, then you show that evidence. And to tell me to just do some research puts it on me. I don't believe you in the first place. I don't want to do research. It's on you <laughs> to show me, not for me to figure out what you found and to try to figure out your delusions. So um, I don't know. Okay, so let's see. Charlie is back. Quantum. Oh, there he's responding to that guy. Let's just not do that no more, guys. It's ruining my. It's just harshing my mellow. <clears throat> let's see. I'm trying to get to some relevant comments now. I seem to have unlocked the the loony bin here. Uh, <clears throat> Third rock astronomy, uh, the moon is closer and we have already been there. Mars is a great aspiration. Sadly, I don't think we will for a very long time. I share that, um, for a number of reasons. I feel like we're get. I feel, I feel like this is just a big push to get. Okay. Let me back up. Elon Musk is working very hard on this and I don't deny for a second that he can get the job done. He's certainly been proven everything that he's tried to do. He's very capable uh, of doing things in space and he wants to, he wants to break neck down there and get somebody on the surface. He wants to get boots on the ground as quickly as he possibly can. I don't deny that he can do that. And I think he can independently do it on his own with uh, funding from SpaceX. And I don't know to what extent, NASA and other countries will get involved in this, um, or even if they can. Um, so I think it can happen. I think if it happens quickly, it'll be someone like Elon Musk doing it. If it's someone like NASA or an intergovernmental agency or a couple of countries getting together well into the 2040s, um, before this happens because of the, the glacial scale at which this works. And I would be fine with that as long as we are spending effort, money, and resources uh, on getting the moon uh, um, dealt with, right? By dealt with, I mean, get some get some infrastructure on the moon, get some bases on the moon, and get some things in orbit around the moon. Uh, that would be, I think, a really, really, really good priority before we go to Mars. The thing about going to, to Mars that bugs me the most 
is that we have got zero experience effectively a few days from the Apollo astronauts having been on the moon, but we have got, but that is essentially no time at all compared to how long we've spent in the ISS with anything outside the magnetosphere of the earth. And I know yep. that we say that we can shield spacecraft, we can shield moon bases, we can shield Mars bases, but to go to Mars first and figure out what's required to do that, I think it's is stupid. I think we should first Absolutely. figure out how to shield ourselves from the moon, which is just the same effective environment as that with Mars is, uh, simpler even because there's no atmosphere. <sighs> it's harsher in that way, um, then I think that we once we, what we've learned by doing that will help us immensely building up Mars bases. We don't even know that yet, how much shielding to put in, how much, uh, what, what the health effects are going to be. And by gosh, one thing that's really starting to worry me, maybe I'm watching too much TV, I don't know, is the psychological effects of sending these people to the moon. How mm. vetted are these Martian astronauts going to be? And how do we need them to be? Based on the Inspiration4 launch, these were just contest winners by and large and across a billionaire. That was the qualification. But do we want a little more vetting to go into the first people that we send to Mars just because the psychological strain is going to be, I think, overwhelming for an average person, especially the first time. And um, we don't know enough about human beings in this environment to say that we can even go to Mars. That's right. It's better to build that infrastructure up at the moon. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say something catastrophically happens <laughs> on the lunar <clears throat> surface, right? We have an emergency or worse, some guy loses their mind, gets goes crazy on the moon. Well, we're three days away, right? We can get yeah. them out of there, get them home, figure out, fix the situation much better. We're in a much better position to do that than we are just just deep diving into going to Mars right away. It's going to be a real uh, struggle if something goes wrong on the way to Mars to try and fix it. And who wants a catastrophic, you know, result? You know, we want this to work. We want this to succeed. And we want to, we want to set these people up to succeed, not fail. And I think going out there without this experience is setting them up to fail. We can't see Absolutely. everything possible. Uh, without getting some experience. I mean, before we even went to the moon, we spent most of the 60s getting experience in orbit, driving around, docking with things. The whole Gemini mission was designed just to see if we could fly up there and walk around up there and mate two spaceships together. We didn't even know if we could do that. And so, so we got experience. And I think the moon is way, uh, it's a good testing ground for these kinds of things. It'll open up all kinds of issues that we didn't even think of, you know? Um, I heard there's a fungus on the ISS. Did anybody hear about that? You know, think about that before we spent years and years in space? No. Was this fungus dangerous? I don't think they know. But the space station is, I guess, just like one big giant Petri dish right now. Uh, with all oh, these decades of human beings coming in and out. <laughs> I don't want to think about that too much, but, but, uh, you know, it's, um, I, I just recently heard about that. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. You don't foresee everything that can happen in orbit. Okay. Let's get to some more. Uh, let's see. Let's see, memes. Have you heard anything more about the space station falling apart? Mm, I heard there's a hole in it, and I heard that um, yeah. it's, like, filthy. <laughs> um, but I, I haven't heard that it's falling apart. Well, it's reaching its end of life here. And in 2025, yeah. just, what, four years, NASA's out. It's not even going to be involved in ISS anymore. And it's, it's looking for um, people to take it over if they want to. So NASA's bowing out. I think Russia is on its way out if it hasn't already bowed out. Um, and so, because they're doing something with China. And um, NASA's already said 2025 is it for us. So, and it, you know, if somebody wants to take it over, then they're going to have to step up. And, and they can take it over and keep it operating. Uh, the memes of destruction. Wasn't China talking about putting something on the dark side of the moon? Um, yeah, I love you, man. That's a great album. 
you know, and there is a dark side of the moon. People, people used to get, I used to say that all the time, dark side of the moon. And there is a dark side of the moon. It just happens to change where it actually is. I think you mean the far side and I get it. I, 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 I totally understood what you meant. Uh, and yes, the answer is yes. I think they have one already there, a rover on the far side of the moon. Um, so China, far, yeah, Chang, I forget the name of the mission. I did a, uh, I did a thing on it, a space fan news on it. Uh, it's, it's already got a rover there. Uh, China just landed on the far, it did it in 2019. Um, a Chinese lander, uh, landed there. But the thing about the Chinese, the space program is that you never get a lot of, um, follow up. It's not, not a very, it's not a very clear program, right? So here's what, it, what the hell's going on? This is supposed to be okay. So here I am on national geographics website and there's like, I'm flooded with bullshit. Okay, here we go. Oh God, go away. I don't want to sign up. So apparently I can't read this article without being signed up. So let me just get away from here. Fuck you, National Geographic. Um, all right, let's go to CNN. Maybe it'll let me see what it's got. Now that was it. Chang, Chang Air 4 mission. That was it. Uh, it, was land it landed in 2019. I did Space Fan News on this. Uh, yes, so there already is a um, lander on the far side and they've been run, roaming around finding stuff, but I don't know if they've, you know, much of their results. And this, this um, website is annoying me. So I'm going to not try and read it because it's like popping up and scrolling and everything else. So God, why can't we just, oh, I miss web 1.0. I'm sorry, but I miss those HTML pages where the animated GIFs were spinning. Remember Homer Simpson made a web page. I miss that. I miss those websites. Nowadays, you go to a website and it's like, well, is there content in here or do I have to like navigate through all these surveys and quizzes and signups before I can even see the damn thing? Oh, God, I miss Web 1.0 is what I meant. Um, okay, so I think I've gotten to most of your questions. There's a lot of argument here um, and, and conspiracy theories. Oh, God. I'm not talking about the challenger. There's none of that bullshit. Um. <laughs> so I said it was made of cheese, right? When uh, Galaxia thought it was made of chocolate, right? Well, one of us has to provide some evidence, don't we, Galaxia? I'm, I'm going to need to show that it's made of cheese. I can't just say stuff. Um, I guess I can just say stuff, but then it's just annoying. Um. I like this. this is funny. <laughs> the sun is made of billions of shiny balloons that people that fly in the sky. <laughs> okay, here's a question. Stephen Porter. Tony, who do you think will be the first to build a base? USA or Russia, China? Uh, you mean on the moon? Um, who will be first? <laughs> I am pessimistic about it being NASA only because NASA always has the goalposts moved on it with every single presidential election. Every, every administration comes in and has different things they want NASA to focus on and they're not the same. So NASA can get started on something and then only to have the next administration come along and say, no, that's not what we're doing. We're going to do this now. And so NASA has to work on that, which makes it very difficult for them to get anything done. This is part of the, the human. This is mostly affecting the human spaceflight directorate, not the science directorate. The science directorate is driven by a completely different set of priorities. And for some reason, administrations don't get involved in it as much. Uh, things that control like whether or not we build JWST versus some other space telescope. The administrations don't seem to get involved in, but when it comes to human related stuff, administrations and politicians get involved like that. Richard Sel Richard Shelby, the outgoing Senator from Alabama insisted that NASA use the SLS to go to the moon because why? Well, he's from Alabama. Huntsville is in his uh, jurisdiction. And so he wants tax money to go to his people and they're building the SLS. And so NASA was forced or, or hobbled, uh, into you know forcing to use the SLS 
uh, <clears throat> to, to get to the moon with, when along comes SpaceX and builds all this stuff that is not only working and available right now, because the SLS still hasn't flown, uh, or even, I think it's fired its rockets once, <clears throat> and, and the Orion crab, spacecraft that's going to take people to the moon was grounded remember it tried to launch in august and they had some kind of valve problem and and now they're back it's better back trying to figure that out well here you know spacex is out there doing this stuff and they're saying you know we could do this you just use starship and and nasa's like you know spacex can do this can i just use spacex so finally in the budget nasa said okay use the sls unless there's some reason budgetarily that or did the 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 i forget the wording but it was something like the technology just doesn't work which was true for sls so now nasa has an opening they can say ah well the sls won't be ready until 2030 but i could use if we use the starship capabilities from spacex we can get there by 2028 they're not getting to the moon by 2024 so um so they can say that, and uh, then now the door is open for NASA to use SpaceX, where before it wasn't. So it's that kind of thing that keeps me from thinking that NASA is going to build a moon base first. I think if if things stay on track with China, and I don't know anything about China, I don't think anybody does really economically about what they're capable of. If they're able and coupled with China to do this, then it's possible they'll be first. I don't know enough about their economies and the way they spend money and the way they do things to, to know if they're going to, if any kind of uh, obstacles, what, what kind of obstacles they face. Certainly they don't face the administration problem that we have in this country where, you know, they have one government tells them to do stuff and then they stick with it. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of um, uh, advantages to that when you're trying to do something long-term like go to the moon. Um <laughs> They have a lot of other problems that aren't related to that that make it not such a great system. But but at least they have that's an advantage for them that and certainly it's the case with Russia as well. I just don't know, know. It all depends on their economies, doesn't it? And whether or not they can afford it. And I don't know. I just don't know. So that's a good question, though. But I th my it, it, my opinion. I think it'll be Russia, China. That's just my opinion. So Lyle, let's see. Uh, this is from Facebook. Wow, somebody's on fa Facebook watching. Well, of course they were. This is a pretty old comment. I proposed a very similar idea about nine years ago in a college paper. Resin, robotics, central tower for communication dish, et cetera. Are oh, you talking about for the um, for the the lunar lunar telescope? Good. Um, <clears throat> And Charlie's commenting that uh, lunar dust would be an issue for many telescopes, not so much for radio. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think what you're talking about is maybe a, a, a coating of lunar dust covering the optical surfaces, things like that. Yeah, that would be an issue. Um, <clears throat> oh, I was going to comment. I'm not commenting this guy no more. Um, stars and images. Wow, we're back to freaking conspiracy theories okay i think i've answered most of your questions guys in the chat i had a had a sift through a lot of bullshit but um i think i did um who has base on the moon first oh galaxia has oh i can't click on it from here uh... oh, i can't click on that link and my little thing um I have to go onto YouTube to see it. Let's see if I can log in. Shoot, my computers. Oh, there it goes. Let me in. Okay. Uh... <laughs> All right, let me show this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if I can show this here on this. Here's your answer to your question, man. Of who goes first. There you go. This is from Galaxia. <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> I think I saw this before. Uh... 
Okay. Um, yeah, our good doofus. Yeah, that's just what that's what Galaxia just showed. Yep. <laughs> uh, let's see. What happened to the inflatable pods that were going to be used to expand the ISS a few years ago? I don't know, man. I never heard of that. Um, but uh, um, the ISS is in trouble as far as its long-term ability. Okay. Um, that, was, that was Charlotte. She's waiting there for me to call her. Okay, guys. I'm going to have to go. Um, thank you guys for a good stream. And thank you for... Oh, I wonder if this will show up right. <laughs> That's pretty cool, Kenneth. I like it. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to head out, guys. Thank you guys for hanging in there. I will be back on Tuesday for T-Cubed. Uh, we will talk about a topic I have yet to figure out what it's going to be. Uh, so I'll see you on Tuesday and Thursday. I've also, quick news, I have just finished the second episode of Countdown to JWST. I will post that later this evening on YouTube. So I, would, I hope that you will check it out. Um, brand new Countdown to JWST. This tonight. I just finished it yesterday, but I haven't had a chance to work on it today because I've been being busy getting ready for the stream. So I'll post it tonight uh, and you guys watch it and let me know what you think. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. Uh, it's it's always fun to do these things. I like doing the conversation part of it. I like live streams way better than I like making videos. So thanks for hanging out with me. I'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. And I hope that you are not un uh, that you are not unwell. <laughs> And I am not unhappy to uh, be with you. So thank you all very much. See you guys next week. Uh, and as always, keep looking up at all. <laughs>